Today, uh, before we get started, I want to thank very much uh, Julie Stewart for making today's class possible, along with the Claire Booth Luce Center for Conservative Women. Uh, they've been a good friend of this class for many years now, brought so many interesting speakers, including today's. And we have joining us for the first time, Emily Jashinsky is going to be with us today, or is, as I was just noticing. She is the culture editor at The Federalist, a web magazine. She's also a frequent guest on Fox News and Fox Business. Prior to her work at The Federalist, Emily was a commentary writer at the Washington Examiner and spokeswoman at Young America's Foundation. She's a graduate of the George Washington University where she studied political science and creative writing. And welcome Emily, um, who I will make a co-host and get her started. And there Hi, you are. <laughs> you exist. Can you hear me? I, I do yeah. in, in the sort Great. of virtual ether. <laughs> Thanks so much for joining us. Of course. Thank you for having me. So I just introduced you. And um, are you going to be showing any video at all or anything like that or just uh, speaking to us? No, I don't have any video. Um, I was Great. planning just to, to speak and I'm a huge fan of Q&A. So um, I I'll sort of make my part, uh, you know, I'll, I'll minimize my part and, and hope to have a sort of robust question and answer with students. Uh, but I'm, I'm happy to get going. Uh, whenever right. you think the, it's I will moderate the Q&A um, there because it's a webinar, they're muted. So they'll write in questions. I'll monitor them on the chat and then read them off to you. That sounds great. Great. Cool. Okay. All right. Well, I'll start. Um, something that I wanted to talk about is something that, where there may be um, more consensus with between the right and the left. Um, I, I wanted to talk about sort of the, the media. It's something that I do a lot of work um, in, in media criticism is probably one of the biggest beats that I cover. And uh, media criticism is actually something where I have a lot of agreement with uh, many of my friends on the far left, a lot of agreement, in fact, so much so that uh, a lot of people on the right have started reading, you know, re re reopening their, their Noam Chomsky books and kind of diving into the, the concept of manufacturing reality or manufacturing consent, um, which I think is probably even better understood as manufacturing reality. So I'll, I'll just start off by saying, I think, number one, the media is our primary window into public affairs. Right now, that window is cracked and it is smudged um, by people who are, are using this institution to protect and grow their power by distorting the public's perception of reality. That is a very sort of Chomsky-esque uh, take on the media, but it's also very much true, so much so that where a lot of conservatives may have blanched at what Noam Chomsky was talking about in the 1980s in terms of foreign policy and the way that the American media um, approached Vietnam, approached uh, the, the various sort of colonial conflicts in this hemisphere in the 1980s, it's, it's now, I think, much more evident in our domestic policy in a way that is bringing both the right and the left together. And the reason I want to talk about this is that I, I am increasingly convinced that every issue is primarily an issue of the media at this point. And that's why I say media is our primary window into public affairs. How can we talk about policy? How can we talk about problems if we, if we all are coming to it from a different set of facts? And the media is our primary sort of conveyor of facts. And that's actually like really, really bad news to an extent, but it's also really good news um, because it means that really what's holding us back is this pretense. There was, as, as mass media, we kind of lose perspective on this um, because, you know, to, to us, the sort of like old brick Nokia phones seem like outdated technology and they, they seem kind of like, so in, in such a distant uh, time or distant era. But when we think about the scope of human history, um, technological advancements have happened 
rapidly and beyond rapidly in the last 10 years, let alone the last 100 years, um, let alone the last couple of hundred years. So one thing to remember uh, is really that mass media is new and it's already kind of falling out of fashion. And what we got with mass media in this country, and that means radio, that means nationally delivered uh, regular newspapers or frequent newspapers, then that means TV, now it means social media. What we got with that was uh, what my friends Sagar and Jetty over at Breaking Points calls this fetishization of neutrality. Because from a business perspective, um, you had what, three networks. And so the goal of each network, whether it's radio, whatever it was, um, or if you're Time Magazine in 1963, you want to appeal to the most popular, most possible people so that you have the most possible subscribers. That really changes the way that you come to the business. And that's why we had this idea of like neutrality, that you can have Walter Cronkite with some type of like 70% trust rating among your viewers, um, because what you're doing is, is trying to appeal from a business perspective to the most pop possible people. And that means coming at it with some neutrality. Now, you can argue whether that's ever been possible. I think it used to be more possible than it is now. You can argue whether that was either wise. I think it used to be more wise than it is now. But the bottom line is there's a pretense of neutrality that exists in the media that is utterly false and is completely distorting the way that we see the world. And that's not um, just on you know, conservative issues. This, we're talking about war. We're talking about business. We're talking about capitalism. Uh, the military industrial complex is one of the biggest ways that corporate media, which is to say the vast majority of media, and this is changing a little bit in the sort of Substack economy, but, um, and the Substack economy is growing because of the demand is so high and the, the, amid the sort of failures of the corporate media. But the corporate media um, is very much incapable of disentangling itself from things like the military industrial complex. In fact, I call it the media industrial complex. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that as well. But I think one important way to think about this is that it's a function of elite sorting and it's a function of the capitalist system. So this sort of shattered cultural consensus on neutrality renders that pretense utterly false. And then because it's false, it's destructive because they're telling you that a subjective viewpoint on the withdrawal from Afghanistan, for instance, or the tax policy in the reconciliation, reconciliation package, they're saying that what I'm presenting to you is neutral, but it is not neutral. It's representing the interests of a, a corporate media outlet and the interests of a corporate media outlet um, for a lot of reasons, uh, don't align with the broader publics. And now because of, like I said, elite sorting, that's now worse than it has ever been. Um, uh, just a, a fun fact, it's, it's actually not that, very, not that fun, I'm gonna read a quote. Across 14 of the most elite places to live in 1960, the median family income was not close to affluence. It was just $84,000 in today's purchasing power. Only one in four adults in those elite communities had a college degree. By 2000, that diversity had dwindled. Median family income had doubled to 163,000 in the same elite zip codes. The percent of, of adults with BAs rose to 67% from 26%. And it's not just that elite neighborhoods became more homogeneously affluent and highly educated. They also formed larger and larger clusters. That's from uh, the Wall Street Journal in 2012. And then the, Wa the Washington Post in 2013 expanded on that data. The largest clusters of these so-called elite zip codes, so among them where the typical household income is 120,000, a little bit more than that, 68% of adults hold college degrees. That compares with uh, other zip codes where you are, you're at 53,000 and about 27% of people uh, have college degrees in the, the rest of the zip codes. So you can see how you have some zip codes where the income's way higher and the amount of adults hold holding college degrees is way higher than the rest of the country. It's just like sort of income inequality. But the largest clusters of elite zip codes are in Washington, East Manhattan, San Jose, Boston, Oakland, Bridgeport, Newark, Chicago, north of Los Angeles, Long Island, West Manhattan, Trenton, Philadelphia, San Diego, and south of Los Angeles. Now, <laughs> in those 15 zip codes, 
the most powerful media institutions are clustered. That means the people who work at the most powerful media institutions sort of have a very different experience um, and generally do have very different sort of life experiences than the rest of the country that they purport to cover. Um, and, the, and this is from Derek Thompson in The Atlantic. In the period that college graduates went from 11% to about 30% of the country, the share of journalists with a college degree went from 58% to 92%. That's great. Um, but it does mean that people with college degrees, uh, as they increasingly make up a bigger proportion of journalists, they also increasingly have very different experiences from the rest of the country. And that's what the sort of super zip sorting shows. And so that means what's getting beamed into their news coverage is subconsciously very, very different. Um, it's not just a bunch of, you know, sort of dudes kicked back in, um, you know, the smoke filled back rooms, the proverbial smoke filled back rooms, it's actually and, and conspiring to sort of um, keep, you know, disenfranchised people down. It's actually just that their perception is very much informed by a very, very different set of life experiences than it is for the rest of the country. Um, there was a, was an NPR, there was a great uh, Columbia uh, Journalism Review did a great study on, on how few, how small of a percentage poverty is of the coverage of um, most major newspapers. I think it accounted for like 2% of the stories um, in a year from major newspapers. And the reason I'm explaining it like this is just to say, if it affects certain things, um, if, it, if that has, if we sort of accept the very obvious premise that the way that we live our lives gives us sort of different um, inclinations, uh, then that means that the, what's being covered and how it's being covered is being covered in a very different way. So I'll, I'll read another quote here from Wes Lowry in the New York Times um, back in 2020. He says, since American journalism's pivot many decades ago from an openly partisan press to a model of professed objectivity, the mainstream has allowed what it considers objective truth to be decided almost exclusively by white reporters and their mostly white bosses. And those selective truths have been calibrated to avoid offending the sensibilities of white readers. On opinion pages, the contours of acceptable public debate have largely been determined through the gaze of white editors. This was a really viral um, essay that Lowry wrote back in 2020. And he goes on to say, for years, I've been among a chorus of mainstream journalists who have called for our industry to abandon the appearance of objectivity as the aspirational journalistic standard and for reporters instead to focus on being fair and telling the truth as best one can based on the given context and available facts. Isn't that a beautiful sort of description of what journalism can be? I'm actually gonna read it again. Reporters instead should focus on being fair and telling the truth as best one can based on the given context and available facts. Those of us, he goes on to say, advancing this argument, know that a fairness and truth focus will have different healthy interpretations. We also know that neutral, quote, objective journalism is constructed atop a pyramid of subjective decision-making, which stories to cover, how intensely to cover those stories, which sources to seek out and include, which pieces of information are highlighted and which are downplayed. No journalistic process is objective and no journalist is objective because no human being is. And so instead of promising our readers that we will never on any platform betray a single personal bias, submitting ourselves to a life sentence of public thoughtlessness, a better pledge would be an assurance that we devote ourselves to accuracy and that we will diligently seek out the perspectives of those with whom we personally may be inclined to disagree and that we will be just as sure to ask hard questions of those with whom we're inclined to agree. I think this is just a beautiful description of what journalism should be. I know that was a long quote, but Wes Lowry is somebody um, very, like very solidly on the left, somebody with whom I would disagree on, on myriad issues, but on this most important issue, on this issue of how we consume information, on this issue of the window that we share into public policy, I don't think he could possibly say that better. Um, it's, it's just completely accurate that the idea of objectivity is, is kind of an impossible standard. And that's a, uh, that's a, a, I just saw a question by the way, Wes Lowry, his name is Wesley Lowry, um, L-O-W-E-R-Y. Um, he, he's at the New York Times and this was from 2020. It's an absolutely beautiful description of what journalism should be and one that I can get completely on board with. Now, 
as somebody who sort of works in this industry with plenty of people who are sort of both on the right, the left, and the center, I know a couple of people who are capable of like really um, checking their biases all of the time and, and doing a, a fairly decent job coming to the table with a what, what you could sort of consider a neutral um, description of events. That's really hard to do and you sort of never know, even, even that is impossible and that's what Wes is getting at here. Um, even that is kind of impossible. There's some people who can do it better than do it better than others, but the problem is we have an entire industry of people, um, that most of whom are purporting to do that, um, but aren't actually able to do that. And this is where it gets really interesting. This is where there are really interesting um, questions about sorting. So as journalists are increasingly people with college degrees who increasingly make a decent amount more than the median salary in America, increasingly went through the system of higher education and increasingly live in the exact same places that tend to be disproportionately wealthy. So even if they're not making a ton of money themselves, they're sort of the cultural milieu of these, these areas, the super zips um, around the country. Here's a, a good quote from uh, Steven Kleinberg from Rice University, a, so a sociologist, and this was in the Washington Post. So much of opportunity in America depends on what sociologists call social capital, who you know, who's willing to invest in your skills. As the affluent become more isolated, the working class and the poor become confined to communities where no one has a college education and no one has connections to the world. The social capital that's so necessary for upward mobility is more difficult to come by than it was in the old days when there was a broad-based prosperity. Now, whatever forces you think were behind the rise of something as controversial as, say, Donald Trump, the reason the, the so-called mainstream media, the legacy media, the corporate media missed that is because they have massive blind spots when it comes to class. And so the average Trump voter is fairly affluent, but where those swing votes really were coming from is you have these, these working class communities in key states that journalists were not very familiar with and weren't able to familiarize themselves with by sort of doing parachute journalism, which is dropping into a town for a couple of days and asking questions from your very, um, your, your, your very sort of uh, singular perspective as a journalist. I always say the biggest bias in journalism is not liberal is not liberal bias. It's just the bias of being a journalist. So you consume a ridiculous amount of information. You read it as a journalist. So you know what all these different journalistic terms mean. You know what it means when something um, is leaked. You, you can kind of guess where leaks are coming from. You know what it means to be on background. You know all these different terms. So you read the news more and you read it very differently. Um, and that's another way that it's sort of difficult to connect with um, the public. And that's a very difficult thing to correct for. Um, but there are all of these different factors that uh, come from the isolation of journalists. Um, and I, I will go into a little bit of this sort of Chomsky theory of uh, manufacturing consent, because I think it has broad application today. This is how Jacob Hamburger described it in Jacobin back in 2018. Without any direct press censorship, with full freedom of speech, the media narrowed the political debate to exclude anything that offended the interests of the market or the state. And then Matt Taibbi, who's great in this Q&A for Jacobin back in 2018 when his fantastic book, Hate Inc. came out, he has a really good subsect now. He said, what Chomsky and Herman were talking about 30 years ago was the use of commercial media to organize the whole population behind the foreign policy objectives of the United States. What's going on right now is far more sophisticated, far more intrusive, far more implicated than the daily life of every person. The media has become significantly more commercialized since then and has developed the technique of targeting information to specific demographics, constantly feeding people content an algorithm has determined they will agree with. That's really important perspective um, from the social media point which is a, one of those variables that's just incredibly impactful, but also sort of fuzzy to us still because it's all happening in real time. Um, but also because he's talking about the sort of post-fairness doctrine America and, and Matt would want to bring the, the fairness doctrine back. Um, but he's talking about the sort of the way that the media has transformed into a business to the extent that it's, it's working with this pattern of elite sorting to, uh, for instance, a really good example is per Ronan Farrow's reporting 
there was a moment when I think it was Noah Oppenheim at NBC News um, was considering whether or not to block Ronan's reporting on Harvey Weinstein. And Harvey sent over, I think it was a bottle of vodka, called him up on the phone, sort of sweet talked him. And the cost then for Oppenheim was offending somebody, right? So like Weinstein made it very clear that there would be very high costs if that story were to go through for Noah Oppenheim and that the rewards would be uh, also very high in return uh, because these are people who, who socialize together. These are people whose uh, businesses, depending on which Hollywood studio you are, might actually be tied to the news network, which might actually be tied to a larger comp uh, corporation like Comcast. Um, and that's a really important thing to remember in, in all of this is that a lot of these, so like ABC News, for instance, that's owned by Disney. Um, and, and you can kind of see the way that the business interests influence the, the media coverage. So that's one thing, but it's also just the sort of general perspective, the cultural perspective. And it's easy for conservatives to talk about this now because the coalitions are shifting a little bit and there's sort of like people are flirting with this, this realignment. So it's more clear to conservatives, like for instance, the Chamber of Commerce is now fully aligned uh, with the, the Build Back Better bill um, and is, you know, there's a very tense relationship between the Chamber and the Republican Party right now, which did not used to be the case. Um, it used to be a very hand in glove relationship, um, but that's is just not true anymore because the interests of their voters are sort of falling out of sync. And that's not because the Republican Party is, is so uh, virtuous. Um, it's, it's literally just because the voters feel alienated by the sort of political establishment, the business establishment, which is a very different thing um, for the right. So that's this concept of manufacturing consent is basically that because of the business interests of these these media outlets have have the interests of the businesses they're connected to. And then it's important to remember their sort of cultural milieu because they have those as priorities. The window um, of what's sort of deemed reality uh, is, is very different than what it actually is. So for instance, why aren't they sort of constantly talking about our calculation of where the poverty line is? Why are they not constantly talking about um, you know, the, the sort of loss of jobs overseas? Why are they not talking about deaths of despair? Why are they not talking about the rise in opioid deaths? Why are they not talking about violence? Why are they not talking about um, these sort of facts that cut against what the intelligence community <laughs> is talking about? Um, and that sounds silly, but it's a really good example of how if, if you look at what happened with the, the Russia collusion narrative that really set in between 2016 and 2020, which um, people on the left, like Glenn Greenwald and now Matt Taibbi and a lot of people at the publications that I love, like Jacobin and The Intercept um, are, are very critical of now. Um, it's because the, the corporate media is entirely, like they socialize <laughs> with the journalists who were pitching those stories and the consultants who were pitching those stories to the journalists and the consultants are friends with the Intel people. That's, it is literally, if you look at the story of Fusion GPS, which is the, the, the firm that uh, placed these stories based on the Steele dossier into media outlets. By the way, it is true the Steele dossier was originally funded by a conservative media outlet, um, which is interesting enough. But if you look at what um, the, the, the sort of Fusion GPS was planting these stories, this is a group of former Wall Street Journal employees who were planting these stories with friendly reporters. Um, and the friendly reporters were so sort of blindly sympathetic to the uh, government intelligence community that they didn't ask a lot of skeptical questions. Um, and the, the bulk of the coverage then was biased in one direction and it created this reality um, that the Steele dossier was a very serious document that had very serious foreign policy implications. When if you go back and you look at it, it that is just not the case. Um, it, it was never a particularly serious document, but we had this reality that was sort of constructed for several years based on it because journalists who are generally left of center just have really good relationships with the intelligence community here. So that's an important thing to remember. This, is, this happens through what's called selection bias. And that's a, which stories journalists choose to cover. 
so why are you choosing to cover all of these stories about uh, cancel culture versus what's happening with this bill when it comes to the IRS? That's, that's called selection bias. Um, and then there's narrative bias. So like what's actually getting into the content of the stories and, and all of that. Um, it, it's not that the media is like liberal or partisan for Democrats. It's that the media is corporatist. They don't cover Bernie Sanders as favorably as Biden and Bernie loves to call out the Washington Post, which I think is hilarious and accurate um, because it's owned obviously by Jeff Bezos and is uh, I don't think sufficiently critical of uh, corporations uh, in in a way that it should be. Um, so you'll you'll always see Bernie covered less favorably than a Joe Biden. They don't cover war neutrally. They don't cover the intelligence community neutrally. They don't cover culture neutrally, and they don't cover business neutrally. Um, and that's just because of all these sort of natural subconscious alliances um, that come when people who are in one profession concentrate in in particular areas of the country and as those uh, sort of cultural um, effects and, and what it means to live in New York becomes so much more different than what it means to live in Gary, Indiana. Um, and the death of local journalism has a huge sort of, uh, is, is such a huge part of the story that used to be a very essential pipeline. Um, you know, people would, would grind it out for years. And, and I didn't do this myself. People would grind it out for years at, um, you know, in Gary, Indiana, in Wichita, in Austin, Texas, um, and in Reno. And they'd grind it out for years. And then they would go to LA. And then they would go to New York. Um, and they had a, a very different sort of understanding of localities and, and different people. And it was just a very different sort of uh, time. And when we lose that pipeline, we lose a lot. So I'll just end on what uh, I'm, I'm eager to sort of answer questions. Uh, and, and again, the reason I chose this topic is because I think it really is the most important thing. Um, and I know that it's not sort of like explicitly <laughs> conservative or explicitly uh, liberal, but it is, I think, you know, it, it's obviously something I'm concerned about as a conservative who sees, I think, very clearly the distortion um, that the media engages in, but really because everything gets distorted. You know, it's, it's not just sort of issues the right cares about, it's, it's all of these issues are getting distorted under this false pretense of neutrality that outlets are still clinging to, um, even as mass media is dying, and even as most of them are less capable of being truly neutral. So the media industrial complex is really well illustrated by an incident that happened this summer um, in, in Politico Playbook. And I wrote about this at the time, and I think I talked about it um, on TV, but Amazon basically, <laughs> I don't know if you guys read Politico Playbook, um, but if you read like Axios AM, there's always corporate advertisements in them. So Bank of America, um, Amazon, uh, like just, just about, sometimes you'll get like Raytheon. Um, they, they always have these corporate sponsorships. Um, and, and over the summer, Politico Playbook in one of its installments that was sponsored by Amazon, which they disclosed at the top, they put an ad that was designed to look like part of the newsletter, um, which is part of what corporations get when they place ads in these newsletters. They put an ad in it that was talking about how Amazon had recently been ranked by a think tank as a top investor. Um, and the think tank was called the, I think the Progressive Priorities Institute, like PPI. Um, but so this is how it worked. Amazon funded that think tank. If you, if you go back and look at who was giving money to that think tank, it was Amazon. So Amazon then turned around and advertised that it had paid for this award as a top investor in Politico. So Amazon funded a think tank that ranked it as a top investor, then used that ranking to sponsor a newsletter touting the award. And all of that happened with very little substantive disclosure. The Politico did not make Amazon pet say that it paid for that think tank, um, that it sponsored that think tank in its thing, which is pretty, I mean, it's a pretty crazy breach of like typical journalistic ethics, which happens, of course, when you have um, ad field journalism. But even so, I mean, that's kind of outrageous. Um, so it was a good illustration of the way that powerful interests purchase and then exert outsized influence in Washington. 
the way that the media allows it to happen and the way that big business ideology is very deeply entrenched in the political ex- establishment. So with that, I'm, I'm happy to take your questions. Okay, thanks so much. Uh, please write in your questions um, on the Q&A and I will read them off. Um, before we get into, I see Zachary has a question, but before we get into that, what do you recommend to the average person who wants to be informed then? With all this bias out there, um, you can read multiple sources, but what, what, what do you say? Is, are certain sources better than others that you'd recommend? Yeah, um, absolutely. This is a question I get a lot. I think the answer, sadly, is that the news consumer and the voter and the average member of the public has to put in more effort and more time now um, in, in, than they would have in the past to sort of have a good concept of, of what's happening. Um, and so that means I would find really trusted sources on the right to, who, like if you're on the left, find somebody on the right who's going to do the best version of what you consider the devil's advocate argument. Um, and then find somebody on the left and on these issues that you care about and that are really salient and important to you, always read uh, trusted people, you know, develop a couple of journalists on both the right and the left, and then you compare them to what NBC News and the New York Times and Washington Post is saying. And that's what's great about Substack is that I read a lot of Matt, uh, Matt Taibbi and Glenn Greenwald and um, all of these different people have Substacks who aren't sort of being fueled by uh, advertisements and, and corporate sponsorships. Um, and when I read Glenn, I know I'm getting the best version of the sort of anti-corporatist progressive argument that I can then compare to what I'm reading in um, the New York Times. And then I can then compare it to what I'm reading in National Review or what I'm just sort of thinking myself as a conservative. Um, So I think you just have to put in more effort now, but uh, definitely finding people like journalists that you you, you feel like you can trust um, on both sides is helpful. And have you seen a shift, um, say the New York Times, Wall Street Journal compared to, I mean, you're young, so I don't know how far back you go, but. I mean, I I perceive a huge shift in those two papers in terms of bias compared to what I remember it being. Is that something you've observed also in recent years? I think absolutely. Um, And I think part of that is what Wes Lowry is talking about in that on, on cultural issues, journalists are more and more convinced that either objectivity is impossible, but they still work for publications that hold up that standard. Um, which makes it really, really confusing for readers. And then on the other hand, there's this like weird, there's this weird idea that like you you shouldn't have to be, or, or that neutrality, like we, we don't have consensus anymore on what constitutes neutrality <laughs> because we're splintering in so many different ways, cultural ways, that if we can't even come to a consensus on what is a fact, you just see the level of bias increase more and more because the version of what's a fact to the Wall Street Journal reporters in Manhattan whose sources are all in the business world is just very different than everybody else's, Um, but they still have that pretense of objectivity. And I think that makes it uh, particularly unfortunate. We had Mark Meckler join us last week who sees the division in America just getting greater and greater. And with journalism being, as you're describing it, I mean, is there hope for the country coming together at all, or we're going to continue to splinter off and, and, and divide? It's, it's a really huge question. Um, and I think if you're looking, so like there, there are all these parallel institutions that are being built up, like there's basically a version of Substack in almost every sector of the economy right now. Um, it's interesting, like the Daily Wire, which is Ben Shapiro's publication, uh, they told me at one point that they were considering creating a men's grooming uh, product, like a men's grooming label, because one of their sponsors had dropped out and uh, like stopped sponsoring one of their shows. And it's just this amazing example of how like if we we can't even have like consensus on grooming products anymore, like we're going to build up our, our parallel institutions. And to some extent, it's good because it might be maybe we can be sort of like more in a weird way, more unified and that we all agree that we're, we're just sort of in these silos and we'll get along. Like, I think to some extent that sort of, again, the false pretense of neutrality is what is so divisive because we fight so much about why something isn't neutral um, and why something then isn't true. But uh, at the other, on the other hand, like the example that I always use is Johnny Carson, 
um, and Stephen Colbert. So Stephen Colbert is the king of late night comedy right now, um, but Stephen Colbert does the most polarizing and the most political um, act in late night comedy. I mean, just, nobody compares to how political his act is. And Stephen Colbert uh, is, is has the same title atop, has the same throne uh, atop uh, late night comedy that Johnny Carson did. But Stephen Colbert gets like 3 million viewers a night, um, whereas Johnny Carson had to get like 15 million because people are upwards of that because people had much, much less choice. So his, his writers had to say, what is America going to laugh at tonight? Whereas Stephen Colbert's um, writers have to think, what is our sort of left of center audience going to laugh at tonight? And um, that I think is is not a positive thing because it means we sort of share fewer touchstones. Only problem is I don't know if any of my students have heard of Johnny Carson, but anyway, <laughs> yeah, they, they are fair. on the young side. Let me That's get to some students' questions. Please continue to write them in. Um, I'll start with Zachary's question. You uh, mentioned the Fairness Doctrine a, a few minutes ago. He asks, what's your opinion of, of the uh, abolition of the Fairness Doctrine? And if you can explain what it was, because most students aren't familiar with the Fairness Doctrine. Yeah, I mean, it's what it sounds like. Um, government mandated the sort of uh, balance in the times uh, that both the right and the left were given in uh, media segments, which again, like it sounds kind of crazy to us. Um, but the reason Taibi is really, he, he likes that idea a lot is that you, you kind of nationalize uh, the standard for what has to happen in public dialogue. And I don't think that's actually even possible because we don't have, you know, three news stations and a set number of radio stations. Like political dialogue is happening on like Clubhouse. Um, how can you implement a fairness doctrine in the Clubhouse era? It just doesn't make sense. Um, it, there, it would just be so much harder to do. Are you are you going to uh, implement uh, the sort of those standards for signal chats that are over two hundred people? I mean, it's just. It would be really hard to do. Um, so I, I don't know how possible that is, but it is true that that had a big effect on sort of like unleashing um, major pundits on the right, like Rush Limbaugh. Uh, that like, was like very, very much fueled the rise of conservative talk radio. And while I wouldn't necessarily say that that is like a net negative, I think it is true that there are a lot of people who had to adjust to that new reality. Um, and I don't necessarily at this point trust government to be any better than our private actors at neutralizing um, or, or sort of promoting neutrality in media. Um, I think government is, is just as sort of untrustworthy at this point um, as the, the sort of private sector is. And I also think people have more choice and, and they're going to utilize that. They're going to concentrate in silos. So it, it just sort of seems futile to me. But I do think it's very fair um, for conservatives to sort of look back on the way that that absolutely changed uh, the, the sort of public dialogue. Do you know roughly what year they abandoned it? It was the end of the Reagan administration, I think. Well, I wonder if it was yeah. like 88, something like that. Uh, during, yeah, sometime during Reagan, yeah. All right, yeah. Siddharth asks, uh, since a lot of the only non-corporate produced content is from individuals on Twitter, Instagram, does this mean that nuanced long-form content is almost impossible without the resources scale of corporate media? Yeah, that's a really good question because that's the sort of long-term downside of the Substack economy um, and the sort of social media economy is that like, well, what's the, uh, how do you, so like Glenn Greenwald going to Substack or Andrew Sullivan going to Substack, um, how do you ever have a future Glenn Greenwald and Andrew Sullivan if all of independent media is happening on Substack? If people never sort of get their foot in the door without going independent, how can they make a name for themselves? Um, and, and so, yeah, I, th I think that's, that's a really good question. I think the question, the, the one way to think about it is that in the short term, these uh, the sort of Substacks and Patreons and uh, YouTube channels, uh, they, they can sort of pressure those corporate outlets into understanding that there's huge demand for that kind of clash and that debate and those, those voices um, that are not tied to corporate interests and don't sign, sound like they're tied to corporate interests um, coming out to like being, uh, having a huge part in the public dialogue. And so I think in the short term, there's this idea that hopefully it, it puts enough pressure in the form of competition on the old guard 
to do the sort of course correction. Now I'm like not super optimistic that that's going to happen, but I think that's at least the, the theory. And it, if you are optimistic, there's some reason to be optimistic that that, that could have a, a, a positive effect. Okay, uh, this one's anonymous. It's strange from someone who's clearly politically placed to hear that the media is not neutral and that the information is politicized. Doesn't it suit you in some way? Yeah, no, I, I think it totally does. So I am pretty open in, in absolutely everything that I write um, as a journalist about where I'm coming from. I, I rarely would, I don't think I ever, um, write something in a, a way that sort of, sort of sounds as though I'm this like passive voice, uh, voice of God, neutral observer. Um, it, it definitely, my publication would not be able to exist in previous eras. And for me, I, I think that's good. I mean, a lot of people have different opinions about where I work, but I have never been told what to write. I've never been told that I can't say something. I've never been pushed in one direction or the other. Um, it, it's really like an independent outlet uh, that's, that is not tied to anything. And I can publish just about anything that I want there. Um, and I, I'm sure there are some things that I could file that would, you know, maybe get uh, like, cut but it's they those would be things that i don't believe <laughs> i don't think there's anything sort of like in my spectrum of beliefs that um, wouldn't run at my outlet so i do think this sort of splintered media economy is good for for independent media um it is good and i hope i'm answering that question correctly um i, I do think there's like a big benefit to um you know ideological voices right now because people just want their journalists and their news sources to tell them where they're coming from. They don't want people pretending to be Walter Cronkite if they have the politics of uh, Ted Cruz or the politics of um, Rachel Maddow, or, and, and Rachel Maddow is pretty open about this, but they don't want you to pretend that you're Walter Cronkite, that you're this neutral like person. Brian Williams is a really good example. He was the sort of heir to Walter Cronkite for very long, and now he's a, a late night MSNBC host whose views are much, much, much clearer, whose ideology is much, much, much clearer. Um, and, and so people just want to know where their sources are coming from um, ideologically. They just want to know what your bias is. And because there's that demand right now, yeah, it, it is good. I, I think that is it is good, in the, at least in the short term. Why don't you tell the class about The Federalist, where they can find you, uh, your writing? Sure, yeah, uh, thefederalist.com. Um, we're a really small conservative news outlet. We think of ourselves as a web magazine. Um, we, we do some <clears throat> breaking news and, and news reporting, but our bread and butter is sort of essays um, from a conservative perspective. We like to cover culture um, just as much as we cover politics. And I think that's you know one of the reasons that, that drew me to this. And honestly, one of the things that drew me to the Federalists is how many, so I'm from Wisconsin. Um, I don't know if any of you are Midwesterners, um, but one of the things that just like really, really, that I noticed growing up um, as a you know, Christian kid in a household that had guns in the Midwest um, it, it, for hunting, was that it, it just like felt very, I felt very alienated uh, by the way that, uh, you know, people in similar circumstances were depicted in the media. And that's one of the things that sort of animated me to come out to DC was just like, well, this is not helpful. Not only is it wrong, but it's just a like really, really unhelpful to understanding the country that we live in and uh, the people we're all paying into the same tax base. <laughs> we're, we're all going into the same system. And so to have these like very, wrong and I think sort of divergent opinions of, of other people is not helpful. And so I really believe in representation. I believe it when the left talks about it, um, you know, when, when there's an effort to have um, a, a sort of rough proportion of the population represented in our popular culture. I really believe in that. And I believe in that when it comes to ideology. Um, I believe that that means you should have way more Barney people in media than you do. I think that means you should also have way more conservatives in, in media than you do. And so um, one of the reasons I was really attracted to the Federalist is that it actually published um, those kinds of like opinions that are very taboo in Washington that nobody would want to say in Washington. I'm not like a huge, by any means, a, a huge Trump supporter, uh, but the Federalist was publishing pro-Trump views and in a way that none of the other conservative outlets were because again, they were all DC and New York based 
uh, journalists, people who, who lived in the city and who were college educated. And that's not representative of the voter base or whether it's sort of right of center independence, conservatives, hard R people, whatever it is. And so I just, I like working for a place that uh, actually tries to make an effort to represent even if I don't agree with it, to represent those voices in media, I think that's really important and healthy. And, and yeah, you can uh, you can read that at the Federalist, and I host our podcast just about every day too. It's called the Federalist Radio Hour, which you can find wherever you download your podcasts. Awesome. Martin asks, "What's your opinion on whether we should just have outright state media in the U.S. like uh, BBC or Canada CBC that makes everything uniform a la Cronkite prior times?" I'm, I'm super tempted. I just don't think that that would work. I'm really tempted to nationalize social media, like my friend Ryan Grimm at The Intercept wants to do. Um, I, I think it, it sounds really nice, but I just don't think we would ever be, I don't think our government, our government is sort of competent enough to pull that off in a way that would actually work. I actually think that's what the, all of the sort of people on the mass side of the New York Times, the Washington Post and the Wall Street Journal think that they're doing right now. And those would be the same people who would staff any nationalized and, and do in fact staff NPR um, and, and PBS to the extent that that's the same thing. Um, and, and so I just don't think it would solve the problem. I think it would just exacerbate the problem of the false pretense, unfortunately, but there is like sort of temptation in the concept. Uh, can you comment on the rise of identity politics and the role it plays in media and bias? Yeah, it's, it's an interesting question uh, because I think identity politics is something we play uh, on on people's sides. Um, I think it's it's more. I think it is probably more prolific on the left. Um, I don't think that it. Do, I don't think it's something that doesn't happen on the right. I think it's something that does happen on the right. But I think it is um, more common because it's more common on the left. It's talked about in a way that is not well understood on the nightly news, which is, you know, broadcasting from New York and DC to the rest of the country. Um, I think it's just really hard for people to sort of understand all of that um, when they are, are and, and that sort of gets to like, people on the right are constantly complaining about cities and they're constantly complaining in a way that like they don't understand actually what, you know, people in cities, like there's this false fantasy of, of real America and middle America. And the, the, I'm in Manhattan right now. Like, this is real America, just as much as Waukesha, Wisconsin, where I'm from. Um, and, and so I think there's like a failure to, to see the whole country as, as real America. Uh, but I do think it is difficult for that, uh, the country that is, is not urban, not uh, college educated, to sort of understand that language um in in a way that is it's like we are speaking different languages um and the, the language of identity politics is one that has been adopted by um the people in the sort of upper echelons of media and c-suites and writers rooms in hollywood but it's just hard for people to understand and i think maybe the first step is at least understanding that we are speaking different languages um and and there's a lot of the best conservative book on identity politics i think is called primal screams it's by mary aberstadt i really like that book um i like Tim Carney's book, Alienated America. Um, that's another really good one. Um, but yeah, th there are a lot of really good books on this. Uh, people have written many, many words. Of, you know, it's, identity politics is such a huge category, but I think it's your right to sort of see its salience there. Um, unfortunately, it's already five o'clock, a little after. So I just say uh, in the class, but thank you so much for joining us today. And again, a big thank you to the Claire Booth Luce Institute for sponsoring today's class.